Good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us. My name is Tammy Liming Ho. I am an associate professor at the English department, um, teaching at Baptist University. Thank you for um, joining our event tonight, which is part of the 2021 International Writers Literary Festival. We are living in an age when human activity is a dominant influence on the climate and environment. This year's annual literary, literary, uh, literary festival hosted by the International Writers Workshops focuses on humanity and the planet. Our festival events explore the various ways that writing can help us to reimagine our actions in relation to life beyond humanity. Our special guests include uh, this year's writers in words who will share their work and insights into these environmental issues. Tonight's event is titled A Brief Time on Earth, Writing Short Stories and Making Short Films. I'm very pleased and honored to have two speakers with us tonight. And they are, and allow me to introduce them to you briefly. We have Anna Togacheva. Anna was born in 1985 in Russia. She obtained a master's degree in applied informatics and has worked as a senior programmer and researcher in the computational linguistic field in Russia and Netherlands, in the Netherlands. In 2017, Anna obtained a diploma in new media arts in Moscow. She is a co-organizer of the publishing house Red Swallow. She makes a multimedia installations and projects which involve a variety of linguistic uh, techniques such as video, interactive objects, cold art and text. And Anna explores new ways of creating text and assessing it through the new media, non-standard um, interfaces and controllers. Very fascinating. Our second speaker tonight is Gabriel Payares. Gabriel was born in England of um, um, Venezuelan parents, raised in Venezuela, uh, and currently living in Argentina. He is one of the most talented young writers from his country, and he has written three short story collections. He also has a bachelor's degree in literature and a master's degree, both in Latin American literature and in creative writing. His works appear in local anthologies and different Latin American literary magazines. And he is currently be, and his works are currently being translated into English. Thank you so much. And what we are going to do tonight, I have, um, I'm going to um, invite Anna and Gabriel to read to us, to show to us their work relating to the theme of tonight's discussion, A Brief Time on Earth. And after that, I will ask them some questions and, and then I will invite audience members to also ask our speakers questions. Perhaps Gabriel, you can start first. Hi, Tim, thanks a lot. And thank to all of you for being there. Um, I will be reading uh, the whole short story of which I read already a fragment in the opening conversation. It's part of a new book, an upcoming book, uh, in which I'm trying to give voices to the, to the variety of stories, short stories in the Venezuelan diaspora, which is a, a very recent and very significant phenomenon uh, in actual Latin America. So this is called A Place by the River. And I don't know if you can show it in, on screen, please. That's right. It has an epigraph of John Lennon, its famous song, Mother, which reads, Mother, you had me, but I never had you. So it reads, <clears throat> You're skinny, she said, like she had done before, three or four times already. 
It may be, have been true, although I didn't feel any different. I even slept better since I was finally taken on to the permanent payroll at work. As for her, she was only skin and bones. She seemed withered, with far more gray hair than before. Not that she was feeble though, and since we had always been a bit scrawny, her case wasn't as dramatic as others I had recently seen on Facebook. Maybe, I replied, my hands were shut tight inside my jacket's pockets. Fall was ending already, and a constant breeze blew from the river, making yellow leaves quiver on the floor, as if suddenly struck by electricity. With each few steps, we discovered a fishing rod leaning against the promenade, and a fat man guarding it, sitting on a small beach chair. Nothing seemed to bite. Everything around them were jaded women and children playing with toys from McDonald's. Check out the river, I said, gesturing towards it. Quite something, huh? Oh, it's brown, she replied. And it was brown indeed. But the dim light of a cloudy day made it look more intense, almost poetic. Ochre would have been a more proper term to describe it. You know, it's the widest river in the whole world, I insisted. Well, it's brown, like the beaches in Boca do Chile. And do these men actually catch anything here? I don't know, I replied. It made me uneasy that someone might overhear her. Perhaps they do it purely for fun. Hmm, you're starting to speak with an accent, she said. No, I'm not, mom. Well, that sounded pretty Argentinian to me. I stepped down on the autumn leaves purely to hear them rustle. I could see the fences of the park we were headed to just a few meters away. So I sped up the pace, trying to keep my eyes on the river. It seemed to have gotten browner all of a sudden, the brownest river in the world. Are you listening to me? She insisted. Yes, ma'am. To make matters worse, I really wanted to talk. That was the whole idea behind the stroll, to let everything come out between us and see what were we left with in the end. To gather those remnants of love and try to make amends for the past. Love is something our mothers teach us to take for granted as early as possible during our childhood years. But they never tell us what does it actually mean, how to deal with reproaches or with the fear of death or with our own plastic shoe shoals squeaking endlessly as she strode over the polished tiles of the walking trail. Loose gray tiles almost entirely cracked, filled with dirty rainwater underneath. There is something odd with the streets of this city, perpetually damaged, like ill-welded bones that need to be broken over and over again. Well, you've been living here for quite some time now, she went on. What was that? I played dumb, hoping she would let it go already. The action, the accent, she cried out. Are you on your own? I'm literally running behind you. Oh, my bad. I went back to a slower pace, but we're almost there. She loosened her scarf and tucked it back around her neck with a proud, almost theatrical gesture. It was a thick, itchy, purple stripe of wool she'd brought, she'd bought from a neighbor of hers in Caracas, some retired college teacher that spent most of her days weaving baroque test lace clothing. My mother seemed to be her favorite client. In fact, she had brought, brought me a very similar piece that I jostled into the last drawer of the placard without giving it a second look. Oh, and that's how you say closet in Argentina, placard. What, are you crabby? She said. No, no. You've got better things to do. You don't have to take me to places if you don't want to. Christ, mom, could we please try to enjoy yourselves? Oh, just saying, I don't want to be a drag. No one has patience for the elderly today, she insisted, using that hurtful tone she also had when dealing with any signs of affection, as if believing herself unworthy of them, or, au contraire, as if they simply weren't enough to satisfy her. 
Maybe she had just lacked love and plenitude through her life. I pointed at the yellow sign of the municipality, standing atop the passerby's heads, and ignored her. I know pretty well where does that motherly sorrow lead to. And if anything, and if everything went according to plan, I'd be free of it in a couple of weeks. She'd be back at home, and telephone calls are a way simpler means of establishing a normal relationship. Memory Park, I read out loud, faking a bit of an Argentinian accent. Oh, let me take out my reading glasses, she said. No need to. That's all there is to read. The place is placid and not too big, located near the university campus. It also pays homage to the victims of the last Argentinian military dictatorship, hence the name. What I'm not quite sure of is how did I actually get the idea of visiting it with my mother, instead of taking her to Puerto Madero or Corrientes Avenue, places where the city poses for tourists. I think I hoped for something different and a proper opportunity to talk. I even carried mate and hot water in my backpack because that is a drink Argentinians use to build intimacy. A simple plan in a pretty place, lots of green and the joyless beauty of the La Plata River. There was also an exhibition room in the park that mother didn't feel like visiting. At first, we just wandered around. We walked along the endless wall, holding the names and ages of all those who went missing during the military dictatorship. We also went through the coastal walk, planted with road signs, each one accounting for the long trail of horrors endured during those awful days. We noticed how they match with times of great abundance in Venezuela and tried to keep a solemn attitude about it, as when facing the suffering of others, like in hospitals or graveyards. At some point, I started reading out loud the writing of the signs, adding any comments that might seem fitting or even, letting, or even getting ahead of the, of the eventual orthographic mistake as if trying to improve whatever impression my mother would get from it all. Do you want to sit for a while? I asked when the stroll came to a stop. The skies had darkened a bit and there was an ominous breeze coming from every direction. Oh, I'm not tired yet, she responded. I have to say how relieved I was to see such respectful, almost interested attitude in my mother. It's actually not that common among traveling Venezuelans. Torn apart by a country's troubles, most of them can't but constantly compare things around them with those they have left back at home and seem to always draw the same conclusion from it. Things in Venezuela are far worse in every possible way than everywhere else. They say it almost with pride. And that feeling alone seems enough for them to settle any, on any sadness, any contrasting reality, and to sentence us expats to happiness and to silence. Whoever dares to contradict them gets the same old, oh, at least you're not in Venezuela, not coming close to understand how can that be the reason behind one's dreariness. Let's just sit down on the grass and have some mate, huh? I insisted after making an inviting gesture towards the park's many green slopes, round like sleeping dinosaur bugs. What's that taste like? A little like ayaka leaves, but it's bearable. We climbed upon a nearby, nearby mound, leaving a decent space between ourselves and a teenage couple that embraced each other on a Simpsons themed blanket. Far beyond them was a sculpture rose from the ground, far beyond them, a sculpture rose from the ground, resembling a big rusty slide. I opened my bag and took out everything we needed to drink mate, slowly and meticulously enough for my mother to gain some interest in them. There was so much I wanted to show her about my, my new life abroad, about this new person I was becoming. I felt like paying her back the loving effort she'd shown me back in the day when teaching me to read the billboards and political propaganda around us, Firestone, Acción Democrática, those were different times. 
more patient ones. Are you supposed to fill it with that much herb? She asked. Uh-huh. It looks like too far much to me. No, it's not. Don't forget it's only you and me drinking. Mo Christ, mother, would you prefer to do it yourself? No, mijo, I was just asking. I know how to do it, okay? Well, you don't have to get so snippy about it. Quit bugging me then. Me? But I haven't said anything. I bitterly kept my attention on the mate and soon realized that the supposed hot water had got, gone cold in the flask, lukewarm at best. Still, I poured the, fist, the first gush of liquid in, on the herb and made absolutely no comment about the quality of the container bought in those cheap Chinese stores around my neighborhood. I drank the infusion and quickly make another one, allowing the herb to get wet. Only on my, month, my third attempt did I manage to get something remotely similar to what it was supposed to be. Had it been under different circumstances, I probably would have thrown it all into the bin. Instead, I offered it quietly to my mother. Ew, it does taste like ayaka leaves, she said, scowling after sucking off a bit. I warned you. For a star winning mate to be had, according to my porteño friends, you should for A, have every hot, have very hot water to power, not, but not boiling water. B, cover with herb around three quarters of the cup, leaving a totally dry peak towering like an iceberg above water. C, insert the metal straw called bombilla in a di diagonal, diagonal fashion opposing the iceberg. If done well, the powered water will successfully bubble slowly like in a swamp. Were the, water to be, were the water to be too cold or too hot, or the herb to get entirely wet, or were some poor soul to commit the unforgivable mistake of stirring the infusion as they would a papaya smoothie, the mate will be utterly ruined, violating ancestral protocols created by the Guarani Aborigines, Aborigines and also wasting precious herb. It may look like a relatively simple procedure at first, but that's what people usually say about things they have no understanding about. Meh, she finally sentenced. I'm better off with coffee. I secretly agreed with her. It was part of what we didn't know about each other. And since hunting for the appropriate moment rarely seems to work for certain topics, I decided to wait no longer and said, Mom, I was wondering if we could talk. We're already talking, mijo. Yeah, but can we talk about that? She hadn't expected the question and took time to answer, staring out to the river. And I opted to let her go. I turned instead towards the teenagers by her side, lighting and sharing a yellowish joint. Are you drinking that mate all by yourself? My mother reappeared after a couple of seconds. Oh, sorry, here. She almost drank it completely this time. So, do you know where that is? I insisted, refusing to let go of the prey. She shook her head and grimaced. Not a chance. No sign of him yet. No, mijo, I've got nothing to say about your dad. I gave him plenty of chances and he wasn't up for even a phone call. Not even to ask about you. I wouldn't expect him to care about me, of course, but for his own son, I don't know what kind of father he, well, if he wants to talk to me, he can call me directly, I interrupted. Has he? Not recently, but see what I mean? Are not parents supposed to care for their children? Two single droplets of water fell into my arm, cold, needle-like. I think he should, should, he should know. I replied. She simply shrugged. I don't need any of his pity. It's not like that at all, mom. It's just in case. In case of what? She glanced back at me, a severe look on her face. It was typical of her to sabotage any sensitive conversation through irony or sarcasm or clinging to the least possible misunderstanding. 
that made me get angry after a while or lose my point, feeling with my back against the ropes all the time. In case I die, she finally said. Oh, don't start with that. I didn't come all this way to become a burden in your life, she rambled on. And if things at home weren't just impossible, I would never have bothered you with, okay, mom, I was just saying, it's nice to have someone to count on, that's all. And you hope to be counting on your dad? She faked a terrible laughter. It's like you don't know him at all. Did he ever move an inch out of his way to take care of you? Huh? Did he ever take you to the doctor as a kid? Did he help you with your homework? He did take me to school every day. I somehow felt it like defending him. Oh, big deal. And who did all the cooking at home? Who paid for those guitar classes when you wanted to be a musician? It was better to keep quiet. I needed things to start over, not start in a fight. And there was no point in standing up for the un indefensible. So I took refuge again in the, in the teenage couple. They were done with the joint and started walking towards the exit after a while with small, encompassed steps. There was also the fact that my mother was telling the truth. I never got past the basic chords of that guitar. And after letting some weeks pass by, I took her advice and applied to a private university. I did it at first just to please her and because I had no better plan to follow. But then I discovered industrial psychology and turned out to be far better designed, designing personal selection tests than following the steps of Paco de Lucia and his Concierto de Aranjuez. Had not been for her, I wouldn't be who I am. But it was precisely the problem. Everything was one way or another her doing, generous as the midday sun. She, she had been a vigorous, self-sacrificing mother, never caring too much about the toll it would take on her life. And that's probably because she expected to have a future, future compensations of my part. But since nothing can ever grow next to a mother's unconquered love, much of an only child's life has to be spent on escaping attempts, or at least in their constant preparation. Until it comes clear one day, that you can't love and hate simultaneously, at least not if you expect to move on. So you bite the bullet and take a choice. I had almost forgotten about that, I finally admitted. See what I mean? She gloated and grabbed my hand amid the hairs. They felt slender and dry, like woo's wooden sticks. Your mama has always been here there for you and will continue to do so for as long as the Lord allows. I know, mom, I replied, counting the seconds before getting my hand back. Her eyes were already watering and I tried hard to ignore it. I hated seeing her wallow in self-pity and how her own words were enough to rapidly get her emotional. She could switch from attack to reconciliation just like that, in a fraction of a second, a thing I wasn't capable of doing. Everything is going to be fine, she muttered maybe to herself, and I'm not going to leave you alo all alone just yet. I'm not alone, mom, I cold heartedly replied. Yeah, I know you're not. I was just saying, I've made a whole life here. I get it. You don't need me anymore. Again, I felt it better not to reply. It was disappointing to see how quickly we ran out of words. I took big, slow breaths, like in yoga. Are you afraid? Was the only thing I managed to ask her. Just a little, she said. It's okay to be afraid. We spent the rest of the time quietly looking at the river. I started putting my things away, just as gentle and compassionate drizzle started to fall. Then we headed back to the exit, seemingly avoiding each other's gaze. As we approached the road back to the street, she said, what a lovely park this is. The following morning, we had our appointment in the hospital. It was in a distant neighborhood, almost in the surroundings of the city. We left home early and cold 
without having any breakfast, and she spent the entire trip complaining about Argentinian bus drivers. All the testing was done very quickly, faster than ever before, and they had partial results by midday. Sitting back at the doctor's office, my mother had the looks of a small, cornered animal. The doctor came in, holding some envelopes, and told us he had nothing to give but good news. If things kept just going as they were, my mother would live up to her 90s with an occasional annual check. No more treatment was required, and she was all set for returning home, although she clearly was a few kilos on the weight. So he gave us a receipt for some vitamin drinks. My mother joked about maintaining the figure, and I simply smiled along. None of us mentioned things back in Venezuela. Once on the street, we hopped, and my mother began to cry. She couldn't or wouldn't let me know why exactly, and I did nothing to, at all to find out. Talking didn't seem as that necessary anymore. I, I waited instead for her to regain composure and promised to get us an authentic Argentinian barbecue for lunch. I happened to know a couple of good places by the river. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for reading your story, A Place by the Water. You didn't tell us about the background of the story. Is it autobiographical? Oh, well, uh, it can sound like that. Um, but it's actually, uh, I, you know, I used a bit of an, of an episode with my mother, of course, but I, I tried to you know, you know, incorporated to a, some, some bigger stance about uh, Venezuelan migration. And of course, I wrapped some of my friends' tales to make some sort of Frankenstein. Mm. But you know, writing is stealing. Mm. Thank you. And next we have um, some videos from Anna. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, Gabriel, for your beautiful story. I was totally deep in. <laughs> now I need a bit of time to, to go out and, yeah. So I would love to, to show several uh, short video poetry films. Uh, uh, for the term uh, short can be interpreted in a different uh, meanings. Uh, for example, considering movies are um, short can be like 10 or 20 minutes. Uh, but for the video poetry, even um, 10 minutes, it would be um, quite a long video poetry. And uh, I will be showing the firstly, just one minute video poetry. This is a uh, really short. Uh, the name is uh, The Freedom. Um, it uh, actually won on the Extra Short Film Festival. So, and it will be lasting for one minute. And um, it has, uh, it was made of, uh, not with my poetry, but uh, with a poetry of uh, Vsevolod Nikrasov. Uh, I should tell a couple of words about him because maybe the audience um, is not knowing this name. But in Russia, uh, it is a very important uh, Soviet Union time poet. Uh, um, he is a part of um, non-official Soviet poetry, you know, during Soviet time, it was a lot of uh, the censorship and uh, there were kind of uh, official poetry and uh, not official uh, experimental poetry. And uh, he was uh, a part of uh, Leonozov uh, art and poetry group, uh, which was uh, we starting was starting to write in, um, I think, in the end of 50s and uh, till the middle of 70s, um, during this uh, warmer or time in uh, Soviet Union. Um, 
and uh, he can be considered uh, like the one of the fathers or beginners of the concrete poetry in Soviet Union. You know, this uh, concrete poetry style, maybe uh, the most uh, uh, famous uh, authors are from Germany, I think. Um, such poetry works with a small set of words um, that are understandable to everyone. Um, avoids trying them into sentences, um, but seeks to make each word uh, tangible, concrete. Uh, for example, this can be achieved through the repeating of the words, and the words are very meaningful in this term. And uh, we can feel the meaning of the word, uh, so not based on our um, everyday usage, but like reinventing the, it. And the text of this poem, uh, The Freedom, it uh, consists uh, only of repetition uh, two Russian words, uh, svoboda, which means uh, the freedom, and uh, yes, which uh, could be translated into English in um, two ways, like ambiguously, um, corresponding to the contents so it can be both is and exists. Um, so in the beginning, we can hear the poet reading his original, original text uh, while the black screen, and then we will see the uh, kinetic poetry. Uh, so I think uh, this is, uh, I hope it work, the introduction and uh, uh, Dennis, please, can you show the short video? Свободы есть, 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 свобода. Yeah, th thank you. So I just, uh, uh, so I visualized uh, his text and uh, I made it uh, like kinetic poetry. Kinetic poetry is um, part of um, visual poetry or media poetry where the uh, text uh, um, acts uh, like a main character. It's a main actor in the video and it moves by itself. Uh, and um, I love this uh, minimalistic uh, style and uh, like uh, the last word of the poem. Uh, uh, so it acts like uh, exists. Um, so I changed like action to the, uh, the word, I changed the word to the real action. And uh, I work a lot with the uh, several ethnic class of poetry, I love it. And I did uh, several also, um, 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 so the, the next work uh, is uh, Swing, and this is with uh, mind text. It's also uh, concrete and kinetic poetry, and it, it's all, also short poetry, so i continue the theme. Uh, I think it's uh, quite the, the very clear example of kinetic poetry, kinetic video poetry, how it can be shown. 
Uh, Dennis, please, can you show the... So in Russian, it would be like Kachili, uh, Kachili, Kachili, Kachali, 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 Kachili, 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 Kachali, 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 Kachili, Kachili, Kachali, Kachali, Kachili, Kachili, Kachali, Kachili, Kachali, Kachili, Kachali, Kachili. Uh, so this is a part of the serial of my um, kinetic poetry. It consists of several works. I just decided to show one of them. And uh, I would love uh, to show also uh, the third uh, short video poetry. It's um, um, it called Mine, Mine, Mine. Uh, and um, it's uh, it based on a text uh, of the American poet uh, Charles Bernstein. It's um, also famous uh, American poet uh, uh, from the language school. And uh, original text uh, has an epigraph from uh, Swami Satchita that Sachidananda, uh, count this number of things you call mine. This is the distance between you and the enlightenment. Um, so I uh, took, um, I think, um, half or one third of uh, Ben Stein poem and uh, I visualized it. Um, so now, uh, Dennis, can you demonstrate the work? And it, uh, it's also concrete and um, kinetic poetry. Hello. My shirt. My house. My supper. My tooth. My money. My kite. My job. My agile. My spatula. My blanket, my arm, my painting, my fountain pen, my desk, my room, my turn, my book, my hopelessness, my wallet, my print, my sock. My toe, my lunch, my pain, my box, my drawer, my cup, my longing, my blotter, my distraction, my underpants, my papers, my wish, my despair, my erasure. My plantation, my candy, my thoughtfulness, my forbearance, my gracelessness, my courage, my crying, my hat, my pocket, my dirt, my body, my sex, my scarf. My solidarity, my hope, my spelling, my smile, my haze, my helplessness, my quilt, my reply, my enemy, my records, my letter, my hate, 
My spirit. My cut. My thorn. My demise. My dream. My plate. My pit. My hollow. My blindness. My premium. My projection. My teacher. My homework. My housework. My responsibility. My guilt. My relaxation. My vote. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think uh, that's uh, all the short videos that I wanted to show uh, today. Thank you so much, Anna. It is fascinating with your videos, and and I am interested. Um, I would like to know more about the 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 work the work process that you have with. Um, your collaborators uh, with your, um, for example, the illustrations that that they have done and the and and the videos, and it, especially with them, my 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 um, uh, video is really great. It's it's very lovely and it's um, I I assume it's your idea and. I would like to know more about how you select your collaborators to work with you. So I, I select them more because I love their poetry. <laughs> so I actually, I uh, read a lot of uh, Nikrasov uh, Savlet and uh, he's a very important uh, poet to me. And uh, I like this uh, minimal style and um, uh, the words uh, itself, it's a uh, very important, important medium. I mean, not like huge text, but even one world. Uh, quite often I work uh, with very, very short um, phrases or even with words. I, um, I would love to represent everything in the, in the words to, to, change i think all the subjects into the worlds uh, representing it uh, i mean in kind of uh, of my dream to create a reality which consists of the worlds only uh, maybe i will do this in virtual reality uh, so these uh, poets like charles bernstein and several nikrasov uh, uh, their poetry it's uh, very close to my to my feeling of reality and um, also I think uh, it's kind of true poetry uh, especially talking about the uh, Sevalet Nikrasov for uh, because he was trying uh, to, to show in a small amount the worlds of the worlds uh, the real situation in the Soviet Union and I think uh, he did manage to do this um, as far as uh, Igor Holin and uh, maybe Sabgir who uh, who were also the part of the Leonos of uh, art group um, so. Yes, so I, I choose I choose their poetry because of the love and uh, Bernstein also. Uh, he he managed to to show the the kind of all your own world in the worlds. Uh, I don't know if it if it is clear that I'm trying to say. Um, So it's kind of, um, is it me or is it mine? I mean, those worlds, so what, what is it? And uh, all those um, logins, uh, which now represent uh, each person in our virtu virtual world, like, can we, can we count on, on it? Uh, do we, are we self-representing us through this, uh, 
eternal logins and nicknames. Yeah. Oh, I can hear you. Thank, thank you so much, Anna. And um, we will have Q&A uh, later. So please do leave your questions for our writers, for artists tonight. And I have some questions to, to, um, for our speakers to start with. Um, so our topic uh, tonight is a brief time on Earth. It is a very epic uh, topic. Um, can you, Anna and Gabriel, tell us the topics that you are particularly interested in, um, in writing about and in working on and exploring in, in your work? Should I begin, Anna? Yes, okay, Gabriel. Uh, well, you know, I think every short story book I've written uh, found out to have uh, like, like a whole thematic axis, uh, like, like a central idea which serves as a nucleus. And um, it varies a lot from, from book to book. Uh, I, I used to start writing a little bit obsessed about her heredity and, you know, you know the, 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 the things that are left behind and um, like uh, antiquities and everything that the, the remaining things that used to be a topic I, I cherished, I loved. I think it's uh, it's always there, like like you keep putting on layers of um, of experience of it, and it starts taking other shapes. This recent book I'm writing, uh, it's easy to say that I I've been mo motivated by, of course, my own emigration and the experience of foreignness, which is uh, a, a very important one right now in my life. But it also has to do with the, the need of try, trying to put language, uh, I, I think, as a mediator between the, the, the reality, the home reality, I mean, the homeward reality, the reality of the, of the homeland and the reality of the new land, the new country. And I found out, of course, uh, I moved to a Spanish speaking country, of course, but as I was saying, there are important, significant differences between how the, the Spanish is used in Venezuela, in the Caribbean, or here in uh, the La Plata River. So I've tried to like allow the, the language to become part of the characters in the stories. Like, like in trying to uh, allow it to express something that maybe it's hard to uh, like, like introduce in, a, in the need of a round uh, action story. So, so I'm trying just to let language shine. You know? And that means allowing characters to speak up with, with uh, problematic expressions or to fail while trying to communicate. I think the, the lack of communication is an important, a very important topic in, in what I've written so far. Uh, I, I had a, a critic and friend of mine telling me that I wrote about isolated people, about alienated people. And I think it has all to do with, with the need of communicating and the paradox of being never have been so easy to communicate with others as we are doing right now with people far away. And yet there are impossibilities that remain at the time to express the truer experience, the, the truth. And, and I think that's a topic that seduces me a lot. Uh, of course, it, it's not an, an easy topic to, to write about, but I'm trying to, you know, like, summoning voices on, on this uh, short story collections. I, I try to allow a lot of different voices to speak up. So every, I have the idea that every short story book should be like a, like a record, like a CD, you, you know, you play it and you hear different songs 
each one made up for a different moment and they all together build some sort of symphony. Well, I'm, I'm trying to build like a polyphony of, of different voices in different uh, speech uh, records. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but that's what I'm trying to do. Um, Gabriel, do you have your work translated into other languages, and how do you how do you um, experience that process of translation? If if you do have your work translated, well, my uh, my short stories have been begun just begun to be to get translated to English, so it's kind of a new experience to me. This one I translated myself and asked for a, an Argentinian friend to help me out, especially with some little expressions. Uh, but also, you know, as, as I was born in London, my first language was English, actually. And later on, I moved at the th when I was three to Venezuela. So I had always the, the problem of choosing the new language, of adapting to the new language. Spanish has become my mother tongue, but it's strange because it's not actually the first tongue, the first language I spoke. So uh, I've, I think I've always had like this tension between trying feeling what's mine and what isn't. Perhaps mm. uh, that's why I felt uh, Anna's last poem so close. Yeah, I, I really, really, really liked it, Anna. I just wanted to tell you that. I, I, I love it as well. Yeah, it's, it's great. Anna? Um, yes. Um, it's, I think my main topic always, uh, which I work. So briefly, I tried to describe it previously in my previous uh, like speech, yeah. And um, I mostly do media poetry and um, I'm trying to kind of materialize the worlds. Um, so media poetry, it's a mix of the poetry and the sound mediums where the uh, medium is the key of the representation. Like it's uh, the most important thing and the, is the materiality of the poetry text. And uh, I, I try to, to make it more real than just the world. So for me, the, the worlds, the text, it's a kind of magic uh, which you can spell and you can uh, really create the reality. So that's why I'm trying to, uh, to make it to make it more real, to, to represent it being like more real. Uh, as a, uh, sometimes I do soldiery and I do physical objects uh, like, uh, like small, small poetry objects, uh, small boxes with a poetry uh, with uh, which you can interact. And it's, it's also teeny poetry and teeny objects. And one object is, uh, is a poetry. And uh, it, it lives. It it can uh, can respond uh, to the people. Respond with a text with the poetry lines, and you can touch it or breathe uh, or like blow on it or yell on it, and it uh, responds responds to you with some words. Or like um, like now, I do just video poetry to. To make um, to, to make the world uh, living, or like uh, in my previous works uh, when I showed before, I'm I'm trying to change the visual landscape into the um, world, into the poetic landscape, into the uh, create create a world a world which uh, will be consisting of the words only. So yeah, I'm, I'm working with the materi materiality of the world and uh, I would love to really create some kind of other reality. Now I, now I move into the virtual reality and uh, I was supposed to, to film a lot in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong during if, if uh, this residence would be real. I wanted to film a lot and to put these filmings into the virtual reality and 
combined with the kind of uh, generated reality with the words. Hopefully I will do this uh, uh, later when I come, uh, when the <laughs> coronavirus will be over and uh, uh, I can film and I can create this. Um, yeah, so it's my dream to combine the the world and the 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 world and the world in the kind of virtu virtual and uh, language space. So uh, to join them together, and then I think uh, we can uh, change the reality. <laughs> mm. I don't know if if it's clear what I'm trying to to speak about. Just the worlds, they are ma magic for me and I'm trying to, to implement this magic or to visualize or to show, like in this work, the freedom when uh, it's kind of mixing of the worlds and the real actions. Hmm. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, my next question, um, so the topic tonight is a brief time on earth. And I want to know, um, in this brief time on Earth, as a writer, as an artist, do you feel a strong sense of responsibility to achieve something through your writing or your work? And also, can you give us perhaps a couple of ex examples of what you feel your work can um, can reflect on um, the, it, this kind of uh, achievement? Well, uh, I think personally, I try to, to keep my work as irresponsible as possible. Uh, I think the assumption of responsibilities is the perfect way of not writing any longer. <laughs> You know, in the moment you, you take it like some sort of work or calling or it starts becoming something else. I, I think it, uh, for, for Brighton for me has a lot of uh, a transgression. It, it's, I think it's empowering because it allows me to, to like force my experiences into becoming something that other people can relate to. It, it brings, it, it makes bridges, but I'm not sure if those bridges are, are, for, are designed for me or, or for them. And I really, and I'm not sure if I care actually. Um, I do think that the literature, if, the, if all the arts are like horses on a track, I think literature is the one that rides on the end. It's the, it's the slowest one, you know? The one that loses all the bets, and that's because uh, literature ends up like a shining, uh, always late. I mean, you discover the, the really valuable texts only on retrospective, only when you know the, the moments passed. So I'm not actually worried about uh, like uh, well achieving something. I I have actually told myself, instructed myself to understand that I will not, to assume failure as, you know, the, the most probable and most desirable um, outcome of writing. And it's kind of freeing, it's kind of liberating because, well, if not, you end up like starting to think about what should I be writing about, you know? And when you start, start thinking, like that, you end up being like a slave of other people's opinions, uh, which is uh, something very easy to happen in this world of exposure and likes on Facebook, you know, and all this culture of, of, of social approvance. I think it's kind of a, a setback for writers. I mean, you know, Cervantes wrote uh, the Quixote when he was in prison and he wrote it because it was, his form of complete freedom to, to laugh about his society, to make fun of it. And I think such commitments cannot be expressed like in terms of responsibility. 
but in terms of, of freedom and in terms of personal, um, yes, of a personal calling. I mean, I think when you when when Anna or when I create something new, we're actually trying to build up connections inside of us. I think we're trying to express to to unite points of the world which are perhaps not naturally together, and that's all I think uh, we should care about. I'll, I'll let the responsibilities for people with actual power. Thank you, Gabriel. Anna? Yeah, I love uh, that the Gabriel was uh, saying just recently. I agree with, uh, with him uh, totally. And um, this uh, power of freedom, uh, it's, uh, it's important even even like I'm not intended to put something into my text. I think through this freedom, it can uh, reveal itself uh, uh, later or inside of the work. Uh, it, is it okay? Because I, I have some problems with the connections and uh, I'm not sure if uh, it's possible to hear me. Is it? I can hear you. Hear you. Hey, okay, great. I just experienced some uh, internet uh, connection problems. I'm sorry. Um, I think uh, that's that's my point. I'm, I'm trying to, to create a new world and uh, to reflect the current situation in it and both to create uh, something that I that I would dream about. To That's that's why I, I'm moving into virtual reality, like to create the reality that I would love uh, to be the real uh, some later. And uh, this is uh, uh, this kind of, I don't know, alternative uh, way of living, but uh, which can uh, impact our future. Um, now I'm creating the work uh, that mix um, dystopia and uh, some possible futures of uh, uh, with impact of the climate change. And uh, I'm filming for this uh, a lot of uh, some abandoned space. And uh, um, I cannot show <laughs> anything right now because uh, yeah, if, if uh, it would be real. I would show some virtual reality in the in the virtual reality headset, but um, I hope to show it later. And uh, this topic is very important to me, especially uh, such I'm living right now in Norilsk for this short period, and it's a uh, uh, very severe climate very cold, but still with um, a lot of uh, uh, bad urban uh, factors impact into the pure nature. And uh, I'm trying to reflect this uh, in my current work. This, um, this um, impact to, the, to the, our living process. And uh, I think this small city can, uh, can reflect uh, our whole life in the world. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I understand um, my question just now, asking you to talk about um, something that you feel a responsibility to write about. And um, thank you very much for your response. And, but are there issues in, your society that you feel like um, you would like to respond to in your writing and in your work, especially in this, um, during these times, the pandemic of, um, we, we were experiencing a lot of um, social uh, and global issues. So I want to know as a as writer as, uh, and also artist, the, the the issues that are that preoccupy you 
very intimately in your own society? Well, um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that the impact of the pandemic and the, the changes, the very deep changes in culture, it, it will bring with it are yet to, to be accounted for. I'm not sure a year is enough time to, you know, like make radical changes in the way we see the world. I'm sure, what I'm pretty sure of is that there's going to be uh, a couple of, uh, of generations, maybe, maybe the new, the, the generation that's getting born right now, or just a couple of years before the pandemic, which is going to remember some very strange times. And that, that could be something interesting to think about. I was uh, looking the other day on, on, I don't know where, on Twitter, I think, this video of a very, very, very small child, I think in the Netherlands, I don't know, a very small blonde child. And she, she was just walking around the park and whenever she could like introduce her hands below, I don't know, a flashlight or something, the, the garbage bin, she just did it and she did this, like, you know, getting alcohol on her hands, rubbing her hands. So I think that there's, there's, there are a lot of habits that are clinging, that are appearing in our, in our current world, which are going to be part of a, a generation's uh, memory, but I'm not sure they will stick long. I mean, uh, at least here in Argentina, whenever people have the chance of like taking off the masks and forgetting all about the pandemic, they do. You know, it's not like it's become a, a, a very strong part of who they are right now. As a matter of fact, I think the, quite the opposite. I'm sure when, when pandemic ends, people will react like uh, with, with an, a, a certain euphoria of being who they are. Of, of being allowed to, you know, like relate again and see each other again. And I'm sure it will be some crazy times when, when the pandemic is over. But um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Uh, I think as a writer, the, the pandemic hasn't had really the, the strong impact on my work. I thought it would. I wrote, I tried to write, to write a diary of the, uh, of my first, uh, I don't know, nine months of the pandemic. And I actually used the, um, the trip, the supposed trip to Hong Kong as a motivation. You know, I was like, well, okay, I'm going to start a, a journal about my days prior to the travel to Hong Kong. And I even drew maps and, uh, you know, like these diaries of the travelers in the 19th century, like, like Darwin's, I don't know. And I, I was enjoying it a lot. And then the, the pandemic started to appear on it. And it became, and it slowly and steadily became like something of, of a math mathematician. It became to, it started to, to appear numbers and ciphers and, you know, relations and, oh, well, uh, so uh, we had a, the peak in October and we had like 18,000 infected per day. So it was like, hmm, today we had uh, a thousand less than before. And it, it's, the journal started to become like a, a relation, uh, a statistical relation of the pandemic. And when I realized it, I said, well, you know, the pandemic speaks in numbers and it has, and its language gained over my own work. So I think that's something, I, I don't know if it's, it's easy to explain or to represent, but I think someone should, and I'm not sure if I'm talented enough to do it, but someone should like, you know, explain the, the, the way people started to think in numbers during the pandemic. I don't know, if that, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Anna? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the computer algorithms can can, uh, can count it <laughs> for, for you. So we should create maybe some neural networks which can count this number. Actually, I, I was thinking about the same. Yes, uh, that you, you were speaking about this uh, two days ago also, I think uh, you was 
telling the end I thought oh wow yes I also thought about the numbers and this uh, but okay maybe that's because I'm mathematician but still um, so I was trying to count uh, this uh, this number uh, as her maybe some uh, tweets and uh, tweet, tweet posts I, I was trying to count uh, the um, references to this COVID into the tweets and uh, I I was experimenting on creating sound uh, installation from it uh, yeah, and uh, I will continue with it also and it, it's a lot yet yeah, it's really huge numbers from the all over the world and they they are speaking and um, in Russia, actually, it's uh, the same situation when everybody cannot wear the mask, uh, they, they don't do it. So in some cities, um, almost nobody wears so just uh, make like, okay, uh, I can buy something uh, and then I put it into the garbage. And, uh, but I think it depends on the country. So my European friends, they say that the situation is um, totally different. But uh, in Russia currently, it's not only the topic of pandemic is urgent. Uh, we have quite a not, not stable political situation or even stable in the bad way. So with this uh, Putin uh, and uh, 20 years of dictatorship and we have many protests and we are trying to to deal with it actually and I also sometimes reflect it in my poetry and it's an uh, important topic for me because it seems that situation get worse and worse and uh, uh, nobody's sure like uh, if I if them will be able to, to travel in the next year or like, uh, will it be the Soviet Union time back or will it not be? So we kind of in an unsure situation now. So no, you know, that's... I can't relate to that. I mean, as of, as of Venezuela, and I can really relate to that. Yes, so, yeah. But considering the pandemic, it's changed, it's changed my way of living and uh, Maybe I even enjoy it because um, uh, the recent years I traveled a lot. I uh, speak about myself uh, as a nomadic artist. I always do some residences, projects. I never have a like, um, I haven't been in home for a long time. I um, usually I live somewhere like a month or three months and then I move and uh, I go back to my Nizhny Novgorod where I have a home and then I spend a month there and I move again. But uh, during this pandemic time, I started to live uh, in one place <laughs> and then found it, I found this uh, relaxing <laughs> and uh, maybe even calm down and uh, to see the things differently. So I even enjoy a bit of this and I can maybe to deep into the work. So now, now I live uh, in Norinsk for the, I think, uh, let me count, for five months. And uh, this is a huge period that I didn't experience like for many years, <laughs> living in one place for five months without moving. <laughs> anywhere. Thank you, Anna and Gabriel. Um, for the audience members, if you have questions, please um, please leave your questions in the chat room and we will have time to get to that. And I have one last question. Uh, one last question for um, Gabriel and Anna. Um, how do you, since our discussion is a brief time on earth, it is a very dystopian topic. Um, and um, I actually teach uh, dystopian fiction at Baptist University. And one of the texts I teach is uh, Roadside Picnic by the Strugessi brothers. 
and um, so I'm, I'm very interested in 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 in, um, in the notion of um, time and how we experience it. Um, so my last question is, how do you conceive of the Earth in a cosmic sense? This is a very big question. Sorry. Um, do you think there is life other than this? Gabriel has a few more minutes to to um, so he, he he's given the, the the question a few minutes earlier. So, Gabriel. Uh, well, you you're asking me if I believe there's like uh, another plane of existence or. Hmm. However, you uh, interpret it. You know that that's a very intimate question. <laughs> uh, um, well, I do not. I do not. I tend to think about existence in pretty nihilistic terms and pretty materialistic terms. Uh, maybe because my my father was a, a very convinced Marxist, but. Um, well, I think the, it's not that bad, actually, that we're, we're going to have only a brief, very brief and probably very painful time on Earth because uh, it somehow should encourage us to, to let leave the world a tiny bit better than what we find it, found it, you know? And that could mean, of course, a lot of things and I'm sure uh, one of the great paradoxes of humanity is that uh, there's people who have made a lot, caused a lot of damage and a lot of suffering in history, and they've made it thinking they were doing their best for to, to make the world a better place. So it's kind of strange to to think in in that terms. I I really never gave this matters much consideration until I had a car accident and um, in Argentina, first time I came here with some friends and uh, was, I had to, sorry. When, sorry? when, when, when did was you it? have that uh, 2010 was that, uh, that's like 11, 11 years ago already. Um, well, we were driving from Rosario to Buenos Aires uh, which is like a four hour drive and uh, the car got out of this the, the, the way and you know just uh, our driver fell asleep so well after the the accident which nobody died and you know it, it was tolerable uh, in a very painful way uh, I had to deal with you know, post-traumatic uh, post stress disorder, PTSD, something like that, which is probably the worst I've experienced in my life. You know, like loss of sleep and uh, the constant feeling of death. It's not like I was dying, but I felt all the time like, well, you're going to die very soon. And I was fantasizing about life being this car uh, marching very very slowly towards a, a precipice and you had no way of getting out of it so you could like uh, scream or cry or feel sorry for yourself or you could just look at the surroundings and enjoy the ride because the car is going always to the precipice and uh, well that that thought which is strangely that thought gave me some comfort you know, like, well, uh, everybody is running slowly towards the precipice and perhaps we can just look around and enjoy the beauty of the ride. Of course, that came after months of suffering. And, um, well, I think we should, the, the greatest thing of humankind and human consciousness is actually the consciousness of death and futility and uh, the end. I, I think that's something we should never lose as a culture. Uh, in, that, in such a way, maybe this topic, uh, literature, 
serve some kind of purpose, philosophical purpose. But I don't know, I think um, in the end, it's, it's of course a matter of how would you like to be on the right to the precipice, you know? And the, I think there's people who find uh, some comfort in collective action, which is fine, which is very, very much needed these times. Uh, I just don't know if I am the right person for that. And I'm not sure if literature is actually a tool to mobilize towards, uh, you know, social action. Uh, I think there are better tools today. Thank you, Gabriel. Anna? Yeah, thank you, Gabriel, for this topic. I uh, also thinking about the death of this, but uh, I'm that person who is trying to escape, to turn something left or right, and uh, to see maybe there is a, another road, or maybe I can fly, not to run in a car, but or dig or swim. So I hope this, uh, this possibilities exist and we just don't see it and we should look better uh, and better and considering the um, other life forms I yeah I believe that uh, we are not only on the on the universe so but we just we cannot maybe we are not it's not possible for us right now to see the other life forms so maybe when we um, kind of evolve like a society or like a human being or even as a person maybe we can change our mind and uh, uh, to see something different and then we will encounter uh, the other life forms in the universe so this is uh, maybe a question of for our thinking and our uh, capabilities to to see uh, and uh, and a question of evolution maybe not like uh, in uh, darwin terms but in some uh, i don't know spiritual i'm not sure it's a correct word uh, but concept Conscience, uh, conscience re revolution. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, and um, yeah, I, I hope uh, it, it will, uh, it will be some later that this uh, evolution and a revolution <laughs> will, uh, will come, and I'm for it. Mm. Thank you so much. Perhaps one last question from an audience member, Leo Lau, and he would like to know whether um, you would feel disappointed if your readers do not um, do not understand um, or uh, so this is uh, his question. Would you feel disappointed if your readers may not be able to gain as much echo as you intended when creating a piece so I suppose your question is really um how how do you feel when 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 your readers when your audience they they do not get the message that you would like to um um the the message that you intend intended for your writing or your work well i should say that most of the time i'm not pretty sure about what the message is. So uh, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've learned more about the things I've written from other people than from myself. I mean, I, I think uh, the, the, the readers I have, I've had, and uh, especially the, you know, the, I don't know, friends or family and, and the ones that, that close to me that have given me their insights of, of what I've written. Uh, they have taught me far 
more and far better of what I do than myself. So I think it's like, um, you know, a, a sort of kind of like therapy, psychotherapy, you know, you go and you think you know what your problems are. And when you're talking to the therapist, you discover that those are not your problems. You have other problems you, ne you didn't know about, which are the real ones. So I, I'm, of course, one does want to be read and one does want to be celebrated, of course, because you invest a lot of time and a lot of effort and money uh, writing something. But, but actually, I, I think part of the magic about it is that you really don't know what, what's going to come out of it and what part of it is going to be you know, successful or, or what's it going to be the things that people like about what you write. Of course, there's a lot of people who don't seem to like anything at all, and that's fine too. So uh, I, I personally don't feel very disappointed about it. I feel grateful just to have some sort of echo, whatever it is, because it, it proves that you know human communication it's possible in a different terms than rational ones. And that's some, some sort of comfort to existence. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel. And uh, concerning my works, I just uh, do what, what I want to do. Like uh, what I love to do, what uh, I I what I cannot not to do. So I just cannot stop doing. And uh, like my work, it upsets me. And uh, actually, I don't think about the audience when I'm creating something. When I'm uh, doing a work, I I just I'm thinking about the work itself and uh, like. I am trying to invent some new form and uh, this form, uh, um, I'm obsessed with it. And uh, when I have some echo from the audience, uh, I like, um, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> like, wow, uh, I mean, about the reaction. I do not expect any of the reaction, nor good, nor bad. Uh, uh, usually it doesn't bother me at all. Like I do what I want to do, I, what I want to create and uh, it does not really matter to me, will I have some reaction or will I not have? And um, uh, when I, when I do some work with maybe when, when linguistics, uh, this does bother. When I work with uh, small ethnic groups, I want to help somebody. I want to help to the language, to the ethnic groups and to make it uh, accessible to, to the public for them. And this is important. But uh, for the other works, I, ju I just enjoy doing it and uh, I, I enjoy yes having um, uh, the response from the audience, but it's always like unexpected for me. I mean, I never count on this, and uh, I always celebrate it. I'm like, wow, I have a good response, and uh, yeah, like it's like this. But I will not be disappointed uh, if I will not have any. I mean, people are different, and. Uh, it's okay. Thank you so much, Anna and Gabriel. Um, I think that's all the time we have tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, um, Gabriel, for speaking to us, for sharing your work, and also for answering um, questions for us. Thank you so much. And I would also like to thank the team um, of International Writers Workshop, Denise and uh, everyone else, and Diana and, and, and Terry. Thank you so much for making it possible. Thank you. Have a lovely weekend uh, and um, please come visit Hong Kong. We will. Uh, yes. I'm sure yes. we will. Thank you very Thank much. You.
थँक्यू